Welcome back to the channel. I'm your host, Semi Sherpa, and I'm thrilled to guide you through the fascinating maze of semiconductor technologies. As we continue our deep dive into the photolithography series, episode 4 is set to offer an even richer and more varied exploration. Whether you're looking to engage in scholarly discussions, professional conversations, or simply want to chat with experts in the field, this series is designed to arm you with the knowledge you need. It's a perfect fit for everyone, from seasoned engineers to those just getting started in the field. Today, we're shining the spotlight on CD control within the realm of photolithography. We'll begin by diving into the core principles of CD SEM instruments. Next, we'll unravel the complexities surrounding ADICD in the realms of measurement and image processing. Following that, We'll delve into the nuanced aspects of process window evaluations as they pertain to CD control. To conclude, we'll focus on the control of CD uniformity, covering aspects such as interfield, intrafield, local, and interwafer variations. And as always, we'll wrap up with a visual mind map to summarize the key takeaways from today's episode. So, fasten your seatbelts for an illuminating journey into the world of lithographic CD control. Are you ready to dive in? Let the adventure begin. In the field of lithography engineering, two complementary aspects have historically been the focus for ensuring lithographic quality, overlay performance and line width control, commonly referred to as critical dimension, CD, control. Overlay is all about the accuracy in aligning one mask layer pattern over an existing pattern on the wafer. Errors here can be detrimental. On the other hand, CD control is a multifaceted concept. It's not just about measuring the widths of certain features, it's about ensuring these widths, measured at specific points, fall within acceptable bounds. These critical features could be the smallest patterns on the wafer, areas that are vulnerable to the patterning process, or even regions that have a significant impact on yield and other device characteristics like speed and resistance. The absolute necessity of controlling both CD and overlay cannot be overstated, especially when it comes to producing high-yielding and high-performing semiconductor devices. This task becomes increasingly challenging as the feature sizes of these devices continue to shrink. Advances in materials and the drive towards smaller structures have pushed CD metrology techniques to their limits, requiring leading-edge metrology solutions. Metrology, the science of measurement, is a cornerstone for the development and manufacturing of both current and future generations of semiconductor devices. In a simplified manner, the properties of the various pattern layers on a semiconductor device can be expressed in terms of lines and contacts. Therefore, the accurate and reproducible measurement of the size and shape of these lines and contacts is crucial. For line patterns, this involves multiple metrics, line CD, space CD, line edge roughness, LER and line width roughness, LWR. For contact patterns, the metrics are contact CD and contact edge roughness, CER. As devices become more complex and their feature sizes reduce, the demand for high precision measurement methods for these various CD values is on the rise. CD scanning electron microscopy, CD-SEM, has been the method of choice in semiconductor manufacturing since its introduction in 1985, starting with 1 megabit DRAM products and 6-inch wafer processes. CD-SEM has proven its worth in terms of high resolution, repeatability, and long-term stability. It's a tool that's extensively used in various phases of semiconductor manufacturing globally. CD-SEM is also capable of providing reliable data on target profile and shape without compromising on quality parameters like resolution, precision, and accuracy. While CD-SEM has its limitations, such as being restricted to top-down imaging, it offers non-destructive, higher-resolution analysis compared to other techniques like optical scatterometry, atomic force microscopy, TEM, and electrical line-width measurement. It's particularly indispensable for photolithography metrology, covering a wide range of measurements including line, space, contact hole CDs, CD uniformity, edge roughness, edge placement error, OPC modeling, production process control, and hotspot monitoring. There's also a growing demand for high-voltage SEM for in-cell overlay measurements to achieve better overlay control. In essence, CD control and measurement are integral to the photolithographic process, 
And CD-SEM remains a vital tool for achieving the high precision required in today's semiconductor manufacturing landscape. In a silicon fab facility, the concept of critical dimension, CD, is of paramount importance. The terminology used to describe CD can vary significantly depending on the specific stage of the patterning process. For instance, in the context of advanced lithography processes that make use of the sidewall image transfer, SIT, double patterning scheme, a variety of terms are employed to indicate CD at different stages. The term after development inspection or ADI is used to describe the CD measurement that takes place after the photoresist development process, which is a part of the photolithography stage. This measurement is crucial for assessing whether the photo process has been executed accurately. Following this, after partition etch inspection or APEI refers to the CD measurement that occurs after the hard mask etching process. The hard mask is used to protect underlying layers during subsequent etching steps, and its dimensions are critical for the success of the process. Then comes after spacer etch inspection or ASEI, which is used for the CD measurement that occurs after the etching of the spacer material in the SIT scheme. The dimensions of the spacer are crucial for defining the final pattern dimensions. After final etch inspection or AFEI, also known as after etch inspection or AEI, is the term used for the CD measurement taken after the final etching process. This process shapes the actual features on the wafer and is a critical point for assessing the overall success of the patterning process. Finally, after cleaning inspection or ACI refers to the CD measurement that takes place after the ashing and strip processes, which remove any residual materials. This ensures that the cleaning process has not adversely affected the dimensions of the patterned features. Understanding these various terminologies and their corresponding stages in the fabrication process is essential for anyone involved in semiconductor manufacturing, as it allows for more precise communication and better control over the process quality. In the case of single exposure schemes, it's worth noting that the terminology is generally simplified to primarily include ADI, AEI, and ACI due to the less complex nature of the single exposure process compared to multi patterning techniques like SIT. Scanning electron microscopy, SEM, is a pivotal technology in semiconductor manufacturing, serving various roles from cross-section measurement in process development to top-down CD measurement in production. The demand for tighter precision in CD and overlay metrology is increasing, especially for next-generation nodes. SEM is heavily relied upon for photolithography metrology, including line, space, contact hole CD measurements, CD uniformity, edge roughness, edge placement error, OPC modeling, production process control, and hotspot monitoring. There is also a growing need for high-voltage SEM for in-cell overlay measurements to achieve better overlay control. The SEM instrument starts with the electron gun, which serves as the source of the primary electron beam. There are three main types, thermionic emission, TE, gun, field emission, FE, gun, and Schottky emission, SE, gun. In high-resolution applications, such as the CG6300 model from Hitachi Hitech Corporation, an SE gun is often used. This gun employs the Schottky emission effect, which occurs when a high electric field is applied to a heated metal surface. The cathode is a tungsten single crystal coated with zirconium oxide, which has a tip curvature radius of a few hundred nanometers. This coating significantly reduces the work function, allowing for a large emission current at a relatively low cathode temperature of about 1800 K. The SE gun maintains long-term emission current stability through two key methods. First, the emitter is kept at a high temperature to effectively deguide. Second, an ultra-high vacuum of less than 10 to minus 7 pascal is maintained using three ion pumps, ensuring that no gas absorption occurs. While the energy spread of the electron beam from an SE gun is somewhat larger compared to an FE gun, it produces larger probe currents, making it effective for various simultaneous analyzes. The condenser lens is an electromagnetic lens that focuses the primary electron beam emitted from the electron source. It consists of a wire coil, typically made of copper, embedded in an iron shell. When a direct electric current passes through the coil, a rotationally symmetric magnetic field is formed, producing a lens action on the electron beam. The strength of the lens can be changed by adjusting the current passing through the coil. Stigma alignment is crucial for correcting beam asymmetry, 
which can be caused by minute defects in the column or electromagnetic field. This is achieved using an octuple composed of eight divided electromagnets. By selectively applying magnetic fields to these octuples, the beam's asymmetry can be corrected, ensuring a more focused and accurate beam. The objective lens is another electromagnetic lens located at the bottom of the column. It focuses the primary electron beam into a fine probe that scans the sample surface. The lens uses a magnetic field that is strongest at the edge and weakest in the middle, allowing for precise focusing of the electron beam. The deflection coil allows for the scanning of the primary electron beam along the x-y directions. It also enables the change of the scanning area size for magnification adjustments. The secondary electron detector is vital for capturing the electrons emitted from the specimen. It uses a scintillator coated with a fluorescent substance and a high voltage to attract secondary electrons. These electrons generate light upon hitting the scintillator, which is then converted into an electric signal through a photomultiplier tube. The number of secondary electrons collected can be controlled by adjusting the voltage applied to a supplementary electrode called the collector. One of the standout features of the Hitachi Hi-Tech CG6300 model is its energy filtering technique for the secondary electron detector. This e-filter collects low-energy secondary electrons from the top surface of the specimen, enhancing the efficiency of detecting secondary electrons from the contact bottom. This is particularly crucial for accurate CD measurements, as it allows for the separation of secondary electrons generated at different depths of the sample, thus providing a more accurate representation of the sample's dimensions. In scanning electron microscopy, SEM, the interaction between the primary electron beam and the specimen surface is pivotal for generating secondary electrons, SE, and backscattered electrons, BSE. These interactions are crucial for obtaining different types of information, such as topographical and material contrast, which are essential in CD-SEM for tasks like CD measurements and overlay assessments. When a specimen is irradiated with a fine electron beam, known as an electron probe, secondary electrons are emitted from the specimen surface. These secondary electrons are generated from the valence electrons of the atoms in the specimen and have energies less than 50 electron volts. Due to their low energy, secondary electrons generated deep within the specimen are quickly absorbed, making them highly sensitive to surface topography. The emission of secondary electrons is also influenced by the angle of the incident electron beam. Oblique angles result in larger secondary electron emissions. The secondary electrons are sometimes used to measure the operating voltage of circuits in semiconductor devices due to their sensitivity to electrical potential near the specimen. The secondary electron signal in CD SEM is complex. It's not just generated by the primary electron beam interacting with the specimen surface but also includes secondary electrons generated by backscattered electrons as they leave the specimen surface. The number of secondary electrons emitted from a sample is influenced by various factors, including the material secondary electron coefficient and surface contamination. Secondary electrons are most commonly detected in low accelerating voltage inspections due to their strong signal and ease of collection. However, their low energy means they are generally surface-specific, providing high-resolution sample information crucial for metrology tasks. The secondary electron signal is a composite of various mechanisms, including secondary electrons generated from initial interactions, secondary electrons generated by escaping backscattered electrons, and secondary electrons generated by BSE interacting with other structures. Stray secondary electrons from the electron optical column may also enter the detector. This complexity makes it challenging to interpret the secondary electron signal, leading to potential errors that depend on various factors like sample composition and geometry. BSE, on the other hand, are emitted when incident electrons are scattered within the specimen. They possess higher energy than secondary electrons, providing information from a deeper region of the specimen. BSE are sensitive to the specimen's composition, areas with heavier atoms appear brighter in BSE images. This makes BSE suitable for observing compositional differences. They can also be used to observe surface topography, especially when the specimen surface has irregularities. BSEs are emitted with energies larger than 50 electron volts and are less influenced by electrostatic fields due to their high energy. They can be collected using various types of detectors, 
such as solid-state diode detectors and microchannel plate electron detectors. The detector size and position significantly affect the image and any subsequent measurements. Energy filtering detectors have been used successfully at low accelerating voltages to collect BSEs, although they suffer from signal-to-noise ratio limitations. These detectors are promising for understanding the generation of signals in CDSEM, aiding in the development of accurate standards for CD metrology. In summary, both SE and BSE provide invaluable information in SEM. SEs are primarily used for topographical contrast and are sensitive to surface conditions, while BSEs offer deeper, compositional information. Understanding these complex electron specimen interactions is essential for accurate and meaningful SEM analyzes, particularly in the high precision field of semiconductor manufacturing and metrology. In the realm of 300 mm wafer fabrication, two primary methods stand out for measuring CD critical dimension scanning electron microscopy, CD SEM, and optical critical dimension, OCD scatterometry. OCD scatterometry uses white rays to collect a wide array of structural data, including top, middle, and bottom CD, depth, and sidewall slope. While it is capable of measuring line, space, and whole CD as well as uniformity, it is limited in its ability to perform diverse shape analyzes. In contrast, CD SEM, which primarily focuses on top-down imaging, excels in capturing a broader range of shape-specific metrics. These include edge roughness, edge placement error, and OPC modeling, which are vital in the photolithography process. For this reason, the photolithography process continues to depend on inline CD SEM technology. The importance of CD SEM technology became evident around the year 1985, a period that coincided with the mass production of 1 megabit DRAM devices based on a 1.3 micrometer design rule. Prior to this technological shift, optical microscopes were the standard for controlling dimensions in semiconductor processes. However, they had limitations in resolution, which led to the widespread adoption of electron beams. SEM offer the advantage of deep focus depth and high resolution, making them ideal for precise shape evaluation and dimensional measurements of process patterns. Addressing several challenges was crucial to establishing CD-SEM as a reliable tool. One of the first challenges was the issue of electron beam charging and material sensitivity. Photoresist materials, which are insulators, are commonly used in semiconductor processes. When these materials are bombarded with high-energy electrons, they can become charged, thereby affecting the accuracy of measurements. Moreover, photoresists are organic materials and are thus sensitive to electron beam damage. To counter these challenges, low acceleration voltages below 1 kV are typically employed. This approach ensures that the sample is viewed at low accelerating voltages, usually within a range of about 0.4 to 1.2 kV, thereby minimizing the risk of charging and material damage. Operating at these low accelerating voltages has the added benefit of ensuring that electrons impinging on the surface of the sample have less energy, penetrating the sample to a shorter distance. This also increases the probability of producing secondary electrons near the surface, where they can more readily escape and be collected. Another challenge was achieving high image resolution while operating at low accelerating voltages. Technological advancements such as the adoption of a field emission electron gun and A through the lens method, have made it possible to achieve high resolution even under these restricted conditions. This is especially crucial for observing and measuring the bottom of contact holes. Another challenge was achieving high image resolution while operating at low accelerating voltages. Technological advancements, such as the adoption of a field emission electron gun and A through the lens method, have made it possible to achieve high resolution even under these restricted conditions. This is especially crucial for observing and measuring the bottom of contact holes. Throughput and reliability also pose challenges. Unlike optical microscopes, which operate in ambient conditions, SEMs require a high vacuum environment for both the electron beams and the wafers. To enhance throughput, Load lock mechanisms have been introduced, speeding up the transfer of wafers in and out of the vacuum chamber. Measurement accuracy is another critical aspect, particularly for mass production. Improvements in this area have been achieved by employing pattern edge detection algorithms and enhancing the signal to noise ratio of the secondary electron signal. After overcoming these challenges, 
Commercial CD SEM technology S6000 from Hitachi was successfully developed in 1985. At that time, an acceleration voltage of about 1 kV was sufficient to achieve a high resolution of 15 nanometers and handle up to a 6 inch wafer. To address the challenges of image degradation caused by charging and the need for quick measurements, the TV scan method is utilized in CD SEM technology. This technique gathers images in a frame memory, enabling the device to operate inline for real time applications. Specifically, the TV scan method can employ either raster scans or interlacing scans, and it leverages frame memory to capture and store individual images for immediate or subsequent analysis. Modern CD SEM tools have been designed to be non destructive, allowing for the viewing of wafers in the scanning electron microscope without any coding and in a completely intact state. This necessitated a significant overhaul of the fundamental SEM design, leading to the incorporation of various features such as field emission sources for improved low accelerating performance, large chamber capabilities, enhanced lens designs, clean pumping systems, and digital frame storage. In conclusion, the limitations of optical methods for capturing intricate details have cemented the role of inline or infab CD SEM as an indispensable tool in contemporary 300 mm wafer fabrication. It provides a comprehensive solution for achieving high precision and reliable critical dimension measurements, meeting the continuously evolving demands of the semiconductor industry. In the realm of photolithography processes related to 300 mm wafer fabrication, inline SEM tools are pivotal. These tools are primarily divided into CD SEM for critical dimension measurement and high voltage SEM, HV SEM, for overlay measurement. While there are also review SEMs for defect inspection, we'll focus on Hitachi High Technologies, HHT, one of the market leaders alongside applied materials, and their flagship inline SEM tools for CD measurement. HHT has released a series of models for 300 mm wafer measurement, including the S9380. CG4100, CG5000, CG6300, and CG7300. Among these, the flagship model is the CG6300, which was released in 2015 and has become the most popular high-end CD SEM in 300mm wafer fabrication. The tool employs deep learning-based image restoration technology known as Super Resolution, achieving a maximum resolution of less than 1.3 nanometers after image processing. The CG6300 primarily employs conventional scanning at 8 frames per second and TV scanning at 32 frames per second in a raster format. Additionally, it integrates a vector scanning technique to address CD asymmetry issues. This vector scan is particularly effective in reducing the impact of charging and improving measurement accuracy. Given that photoresist materials are insulators and sensitive to electron beam damage, the CG6300 operates under low acceleration voltage conditions ranging from 0.3 to 5 kV during ADICD measurements. This minimizes the risk of charging and material damage. The tool's MAM time, an acronym for MOVE, ACQUIRE, MEASURE, is a key metric related to throughput or wafer production per hour. It indicates the time taken to move the stage to the measurement location, perform electron beam scanning, and acquire a single image frame. The MAM time is less than or equal to 1.6 seconds per point, and the throughput is 60 wafers per hour. The field of view, FOV, and pixel count are crucial for image quality. A larger FOV and higher pixel count, ranging from 256 to 4096 pixels, allow for more CD images to be obtained over a wider area facilitating more accurate statistical analysis. The CG6300 supports both SE and BSE modes in its detectors and incorporates proprietary hardware technologies like e-filters to enhance image contrast. Specifically, the e-filter technology has been improved to enhance the accuracy of bottom CD measurements, and it supports selective SE plus BSE detection. The SEM uses two types of SE detectors, direct and converting detectors, and employs a high-resolution off-axis e-filter and a new design for its top BSE detector. For overlay measurement, HHT has released models like the CV5000 and CV6300. The latest model, CV6300, is designed for situations requiring in-cell overlay measurement. It uses a high-voltage accelerated electron beam and detects backscattered electrons, BSE, 
to directly measure the overlay between the current and previous layers on the main chip. Given the high voltage, which ranges from 15 to 45 kilovolts, this method is usually employed post etching to prevent damage to the photoresist material. Although it has a relatively short history since its initial release in 2015, it's considered an essential technology for in cell overlay measurement. Comparatively, the CV6300 uses high voltage acceleration and focuses on BSE detection. It also supports 360 degree wafer rotation for overlay measurement, setting it apart functionally from CD SEM hardware. The CV6300 employs a cold field emission, CFE, electron gun with quick flashing and has a probe current of less than 2000 picoampere. Its dynamic repeatability is less than 0.3 nanometers with a 3 sigma value, and its MAM time is less than 6 seconds. The SEM uses three detectors, top, upper, and lower, to acquire multi-channel images simultaneously. The top detector captures BSE emitted vertically from a wafer, the upper detector captures either SE or BSE switch by an energy filter, and the lower detector captures BSE from oblique directions. The SEM also incorporates a new E-filter to separate BSE signals and a new objective lens designed for low aberration at high voltages. To sum up, HHT's flagship inline SEM tools, particularly the CG6300 for CD measurement and the CV6300 for overlay measurement, offer a comprehensive suite of features and technologies. These tools are designed to meet the stringent requirements of modern 300mm wafer fabrication, providing high precision and reliability in critical dimension and overlay measurements. In the complex field of semiconductor manufacturing, the need for high-resolution imaging for precise CD measurements has become increasingly important. Hitachi High Technologies, HHT, has been a leader in this area, particularly with their inline CD SEM tools designed for 300mm wafers. The quest for higher resolution began with early metrology SEM models around 1985. These models face challenges in imaging VLSI circuits made of insulating materials like silicon oxide, silicon nitride, and photoresist, which are susceptible to charging artifacts when exposed to an electron beam. To mitigate this, low accelerating voltages around 1 kV were used, enhancing secondary electron emission and reducing charging effects. Traditional thermionic electron sources like tungsten hairpin and lanthanium hexaboride filaments were less effective at these low voltages due to their large energy spread. In contrast, field emission electron sources had a much smaller energy spread, minimizing chromatic aberrations and improving image resolution to about 15 nanometers. These models were designed for top-down analysis and minimized the working distance between the objective lens and the sample, further reducing lens aberrations. The field emission sources also had a source brightness 100 to 1000 times greater than thermionic sources, essential for achieving high-resolution images quickly and maintaining a better signal-to-noise ratio. This was particularly beneficial for process evaluation SEMs requiring prolonged continuous operation. HHT then made a significant advancement by introducing the snorkel objective lens, improving the resolution to 8 nanometers. This lens was effective at low acceleration voltages and minimized blur caused by lens aberrations. HHT specifically designed a strongly excited objective lens to address chromatic aberration at lower voltages. The snorkel lens design positioned the specimen immediately below the objective lens, extending its magnetic field to the sample's surface. This allowed for high-resolution imaging while examining larger specimens without compromising resolution. HHT further improved image resolution to approximately 5 nanometers by introducing the Schottky emission gun and the retarding method. The initial field emission guns were effective but required periodic heating and degassing, making them less practical for long-term use. To solve this, HHT switched to a Schottky-type electron gun, providing long-term emission current stability without the need for periodic maintenance. This gun operates with a single crystal tungsten tip coated with zirconium, heated at 1800 K. Although its energy spread is slightly larger than cold field emission sources, it offers better long-term stability. To counteract the increased chromatic aberrations, a retarding system was developed that negatively biases the sample, decelerating the primary electron beam as it arrives, thereby reducing chromatic aberration and improving resolution to 5 nanometers. 
In the era of 100 nanometers processes, HHT employed a retarding plus boosting method, enhancing image resolution to 2 nanometers. The boosting method focuses on capturing secondary electrons from complex patterns, particularly effective for imaging deep, narrow structures. The boosting voltage is optimized around 5 kV, and the upper pole piece of the objective lens is maintained at a high positive voltage, reducing lens aberrations. The latest advancement has been the use of super-resolution technology, leveraging deep learning algorithms to enhance image quality. This technology uses a neural network trained on high-resolution images to predict missing details in lower-resolution images. It attains an impressive resolution of less than 1.3 nanometers, which is notably close to the practical limit of 1 nanometer resolution and approaches at base theoretical resolution limit of half a nanometer. This method overcomes traditional limitations like noise and blurriness, setting a new standard in the field. Through these successive innovations, HHT's inline CD SEM tools have set new benchmarks in image resolution, meeting the stringent demands of modern semiconductor manufacturing. Inline CD SEM serves as a cornerstone technology in semiconductor manufacturing, offering precise topology information and CD quantification. The technology hinges on the unique properties of secondary electrons, SE, which are generated when a primary electron beam interacts with the specimen. These SE have an escape depth of less than 5 nanometers, making them highly sensitive to surface features. This sensitivity is crucial for capturing the topography of complex structures like photoresist line patterns. The edge effect is a key phenomenon that comes into play, especially in these intricate structures. When the primary electron beam enters at an oblique angle, the interaction volume increases, leading to a higher yield of SE from the top corners and sidewalls compared to flat surfaces. This is essential for generating topographic contrast in SE images. The yield of SE is also influenced by the angle of the electron beam, and oblique entry results in a higher yield, illuminating regions that are not perpendicular to the beam. This is because SE generated by diffused electrons in the specimen are more likely to escape from the edge surface, appearing bright in SE images. The brightness level is proportional to the slopes of features, following the 1 over cosine theta rule or secant effect, which is vital for observing surface topography. Once secondary electrons are emitted, a detector captures their raw signal. The electron beam scans horizontally in the X direction, and additional scan lines are added vertically in the Y direction to construct the SEM image, also known as the signal, over the target FOV area. The signal represents the electron current intensity at each location on the detector for every scan line. Typically, a single scan line is insufficient for achieving a high-quality image with a good signal-to-noise ratio, depending on the scan rate and speed. Therefore, image acquisition usually requires 8 frames for conventional scans and 32 frames for TV scans. A frame consists of a complete scan of the target FOV area, and the number of frames, or scans per line, is determined by the scan duration at a constant speed. The process for measuring the CD of a line and space pattern, as illustrated in right figure, starts with capturing a grayscale SEM image. This image shows a cut line and its corresponding amplitude and derivative signals. Attention is then directed to a specific region within the image, known as the measurement box, which is highlighted by an orange rectangle. Inside this box, the signal is carefully analyzed line by line along the cut line. To enhance the quality of the data, each extracted cut line signal undergoes a smoothing process, typically achieved through a low-pass filter. This smoothed signal is then averaged with signals from a few neighboring cut lines to refine the data further. These cleaned and averaged cut line signals are subsequently aggregated within a broader metrology window, resulting in a final, representative signal that encapsulates the essential features of the pattern within the field of view FOV. This final signal is then subjected to a specialized metrology algorithm designed to determine a pair of edge positions for the pattern. The algorithm achieves this by analyzing either the amplitude or the derivative of the signal. The output from this algorithm is ultimately used to derive the CD of the line and space pattern. In summary, the process involves capturing an SEM image, focusing on a specific measurement box, employing various techniques to enhance and average the signal, and finally processing this signal through a metrology algorithm to determine the CD of the pattern within the field of view. However, this processed signal often experiences blooming, 
which complicates the accurate detection of feature edges like those in photoresist. To translate this blooming SE profile into a quantifiable CD value, a range of computational methods are employed. These can include thresholding, linear regression, and differentiation, among others. The threshold method, for instance, uses a percentage intensity value to determine the CD, allowing for adjustments to focus on either the top or bottom CD as needed. Companies like Hitachi use specialized techniques such as waveform matching scan and constant gradient method. Finally, it's important to note that the CD values obtained are relative and require calibration for absolute accuracy. This calibration is performed using standard samples, often provided by organizations like NIST, to ensure tool-to-tool matching. During chip integration, these CD values are further validated by comparing them with measurements obtained from other methods like TEM and vertical SEM. In summary, Inline CD SEM is a multifaceted tool that leverages the unique properties of SE for detailed topological analysis and CD quantification. While the CD values are relative, calibration and cross validation steps ensure their utility and accuracy in semiconductor manufacturing. Imaging VLSI circuits made of insulating materials like silicon oxide, silicon nitride, and photoresist is fraught with challenges, primarily due to their propensity to charge when exposed to an electron beam. This charging can drastically degrade the quality of both imaging and measurements. To counteract this, low accelerating voltages around 1 kV are typically employed. When a specimen is exposed to an electron beam, the number of electrons entering and exiting may not be equal, leading to charging. The concept of E2 voltage is crucial here. This is a specific energy level where the number of emitted electrons equals the number of incident electrons, thereby maintaining charge neutrality. Scanning electron microscopes are generally operated close to this E2 voltage to ensure stable imaging. For conductive materials, the E2 voltage ranges from 2 to 4 kV, while for nonconductive materials like photoresist, it's between 0.5 to 1.0 kV. Operating near this E2 point is preferred for achieving stable and accurate measurements. However, complete charge neutrality is often elusive due to factors such as the material's properties and the angle between the incident electron beam and the specimen surface. Charging also complicates line width measurements. For example, a negatively charged line can deflect the electron beam, resulting in a narrower measurement than intended. Charging introduces another layer of complexity by causing the SEM profile to appear asymmetric, particularly when imaging easily charged samples like photoresist coated wafers. If the specimen becomes charged, the electron probe scanning it is deflected, leading to image distortion. Even minimal charging that doesn't directly affect the electron probe scan can still influence secondary electrons with low energy, causing a voltage contrast where parts of the image appear either bright or dark. In line with measurements, there's a distinct asymmetry on two sides of a feature. This is because the electron beam is typically scanned from left to right, and the scans during which signals are detected are always in the same direction. As a result, the image from one side of the feature consistently differs from the other. The peak intensity is higher on the left than on the right, affecting the overall measurement. This asymmetry doesn't just impact line width measurements, It also affects equivalent edge detection in all directions, vertical, horizontal, right, and left. This is particularly problematic for accurate EPE measurements and SEM contour extraction, which are critical in OPC works. Therefore, the issue of asymmetry, tied closely to charging effects, poses significant challenges in both line-width measurements and OPC, requiring meticulous attention to various contributing factors. To tackle these challenges, Hitachi has developed innovative solutions in their latest CD-SEM model, the CG6300. The first method is the faster scan, which increases the scanning speed in two variants, X2 faster and X4 faster. This reduces the electron beam irradiation time, suppressing surface potential due to charging and improving the yield of secondary electrons. The second is the special scan, enabled by an electrostatic deflector system that replaces the traditional electromagnetic coil. The traditional electromagnetic coil had limitations in easily controlling eddy currents induced by the electromagnetic field and suffered from slow response times due to hysteresis. On the other hand, the electrostatic deflection system allows for easier control and faster response times, 
enabling scanning in any desired direction. The special scan incorporates three advanced techniques, wide scan, rain scan, and wind scan, each serving a specific purpose in controlling charging effects and improving image quality. Evaluation showed that the special scan method was particularly effective in suppressing charge-induced errors in all edge directions. In summary, Hitachi CG6300 offers groundbreaking solutions for charge control, setting a new standard in the field with its faster scan and special scan methods, along with a newly introduced electrostatic system. It stands as a strong candidate for resolving the long-standing challenges posed by charging in CD SEM applications. CD slimming occurs when the photoresist is exposed to the electron beam energy from the CD SEM equipment. The higher the electron beam energy, the more significant the CD slimming effect. This is primarily due to two mechanisms, solvent evaporation, which is the effect of heat induced by electron energy, and cleavage and crosslinking by polymer chains, often explained by the free volume theory. The main CD SEM conditions that affect resist shrinkage are the E-beam accelerating voltage and dose. Dose is defined as the charge deposited per unit area, which depends on beam current, E-beam exposure time, and irradiated area. Production practitioners usually choose a high-dose, high-voltage strategy to achieve repeatable shrinkage or use a low-dose, low-voltage strategy to optimize raw precision and minimize the accuracy offset. The issue of CD slimming is particularly acute in ARF resists as many of the materials that compose them are modified by electron beams. This leads to a shrinkage in resist line widths when exposed to electron beams, as is the case in SEMS. According to studies, immersion ARF photoresists behave consistently with dry ARF photoresists in terms of shrinkage. The size of the photoresist feature has much more to do with the amount and speed of the observed shrinkage than other considerations like different resist formulations or different resist sensitivities. The severity of the slimming effect also varies depending on the type of resist used. For instance, the slimming amount is more severe in polymethyl methacrylate PMMA, than in cyclolfin maleic and hydride COMA, resist. The reaction process for photoresist slimming has different half-life times for the outer rim, main bulk, and the entire material, which are 2 to 8 seconds, 30 to 40 seconds, and 10 to the power of 4 seconds, respectively. To address these challenges, new solution methods have been introduced. The conventional method usually involves using 8 frames at the same field of view, FOV, for noise reduction because usually one scan of each line is not enough to get an image with a good signal-to-noise ratio. However, in ARF mode, image gathering is done from eight different FOVs with beam shift, which results in a reduction of electron dose per unit area and effectively reduces beam current density without image decline. Limitations are also imposed on accelerating voltage, probe current, and measurement magnification in this mode. Lastly, it's important to avoid remeasuring the same slot for CD, as this can lead to discrepancies due to the slimming effect. Also, the location where the CD is measured could later be identified as defective, so it's crucial to understand the extent of the slimming effect when performing CD measurements. Typically, a separate CD box is set up in the scribe line or the extra space of the device chip for measurement purposes. In a 300 mm wafer fabrication facility, the process of measuring CD using inline CD SEM is a multi step endeavor that begins with a series of precise alignments. The wafer is initially inserted into a load chamber that maintains a vacuum level below 10 to minus 3 pascal using turbo molecular pump. Within this chamber, a mechanoptical prealigner aligns the wafer based on its conventional notch or flat area, preparing it for transfer to the main chamber. Once the wafer is in the main chamber and placed on a stage, previous alignments enable navigation within a field of view FOV, of approximately half a millimeter. Here, a pre-learned pattern mark is identified under an optic microscope. Any discrepancies between the assumed and actual positions of this mark are used to fine-tune the wafer's alignment, achieving a navigation accuracy within 1 to 3 micrometers. This phase is known as global alignment GA, and serves as the starting point for the automated SEM imaging sequence. With this level of navigation accuracy, it becomes possible to identify the required feature within an SEM image FAV of 5 micrometers or below. At this juncture, the stage becomes static, and the addressing step in the automated sequence is initiated. 
This step involves fine-tuning the focus and capturing an initial SEM image for pattern recognition using Z-Sensor. An anchor reference is then identified in the SEM FOV, and two vectors are obtained, one for the location where SEM autofocus is performed and another for the exact location to be scanned. This corresponds to the measurement point step in the automated sequence, where focus is fine-tuned, another SEM image is captured, and the pattern is recognized for precise measurement. Once the focus value is known, the electron beam scans the exact location, acquiring the SEM image for the actual CD measurement. After the electron beam scans the exact location and acquires the SEM image for the actual CD measurement, the stage moves to align with the next measurement point within the SEM's field of view, FOV. This initiates another cycle of the automated sequence, starting with the move stage step followed by addressing where the focus is fine-tuned and SEM image is captured and the pattern is recognized. This leads to the measurement point step, where focus is further fine-tuned, another SEM image is captured, and the pattern is recognized for precise measurement. The actual CD measurement is then performed on the recognized pattern using the captured SEM image. This sequence of stage movement, addressing, measurement point identification, and actual measurement is repeated for each measurement point specified in the measurement recipe. The loop continues until all designated measurement points in the recipe have been accurately captured and measured. This integrated sequence ensures that the wafer is precisely aligned and ready for accurate CD measurement while also accommodating the automated steps for capturing and measuring each point on the wafer. The automatic generation of imaging sequences for CD SEM is another noteworthy feature. It involves a series of actions, stage movement, addressing, image acquisition, and pattern measurement, that are encapsulated in a unit known as a measurement recipe. Once created, this recipe enables automated measurements without operator intervention. For facilities equipped with Hitachi High Technologies CG4000 model or later, the design gauge feature allows for a waferless setup. This means that measurement locations are determined based on chip pattern layout data, enabling the pre-configuration of measurement recipes even without a physical wafer. This advancement has made metrology engineers a rare sight in clean fabs. Design. Gauge offers two significant advantages. First, it eliminates the need for physical wafers, allowing for the advanced creation of measurement recipes. Second, it enables the rapid creation of multi-point measurement recipes, reducing the time needed to about one-tenth compared to conventional methods. This efficiency is particularly beneficial when dealing with thousands of measurement points, making it possible to perform multiple point measurements in a short time. Consequently, design gauge contributes significantly to improving wafer yield in modern 300 mm wafer fab. In semiconductor manufacturing, the use of high voltage SEM has emerged as a specialized tool for certain measurement objectives. Unlike standard CD SEM, HV SEM allows for adjustments in electron accelerating voltage resolution, and the number of detector channels. The technology leverages the property that the penetration depth of incident electrons into a sample increases with higher accelerating voltage and is inversely proportional to the material's atomic number. This enables non-destructive visualization of subsurface structures by capturing electrons that have scattered after colliding with underlying features. However, the use of FESA imposes challenges, particularly the risk of electron damage, making it less suitable for on-cell overlay or CD metrology. To mitigate this, specialized cell-like key patterns are often created for measurements. Studies have suggested that using a high-voltage column greater than 30 kV and imaging with backscattered electrons instead of secondary electrons could improve resolution and reduce surface damage. However, there are concerns about potential damage to transistors if high-energy electrons are used in active areas. Intel's research has shown that transistors subjected to high-voltage radiation undergo changes that could lead to reliability issues, making HVSEM less attractive for CD metrology in its current form. HVSEM has been adopted for overlay measurements in memory and logic devices at AEI or even after ADI step. This allows for immediate feedback to the scanner. SEM-based overlay measurement using transient voltage contrast has been developed and proven capable of overlay measurement without sample damage when low acceleration voltage conditions are applied. For beyond 3 nanometer node logic and cutting-edge DRAM devices, HV-SEM and small measurement targets have been used for high-order overlay correction. 
The technology is particularly useful for achieving more stringent overlay control. HVSEM systems typically consist of a scanning high voltage beam, 15 to 45 kilovolts, a large specimen chamber containing a special BSE detector, and a precision stage to accommodate semiconductor wafers. The demand for HVSEM has been driven by the need to understand issues like electromigration and semiconductor devices, especially with the advent of 3D and high aspect ratio constructions like 3D NAND. To meet this demand, Hitachi developed the advanced high voltage CD SEM, CV5000 series, capable of measuring actual device patterns. This series is the first to be fitted with a 30 kV electron gun and can measure the bottom of deep trenches and contact holes, as well as perform high precision overlay measurements through insulator films. Especially in the context of 3D NAND, the CV5000 series uses high energy BSE detection to measure deep trenches more than 3 microns deep. For overlay measurements, it can achieve unprecedented accuracy and repeatability of 0.3 nanometers or less. In photolithography, dose is a critical factor for controlling the CD of the features that are being printed on a substrate. The dose is essentially the total amount of photons that are incident on a unit area, usually expressed in units of joule per square meter. In the context of ARF light sources, the energy of a single photon is around 10 to the minus 18 joule, and this energy increases as the wavelength of the light decreases. Companies like ASML, a leader in photolithography systems, use the unit millijoule per square centimeter to represent dose, which is equivalent to 10 to the power of 15 photons incident per square centimeter. The dose is typically regulated by the number of laser pulses emitted by the lithography tool, which could be a stepper or a scanner. These tools use ARF excimer laser systems that have a pulse duration ranging from 60 to 150 nanoseconds and an energy of 5 to 20 millijoules per pulse. The dose is applied according to a predefined recipe, and the laser is blocked after a consistent amount of light has been applied to one field. The tool then moves to the next field and continues the scanning process. In the case of EUV lithography, the dose time is adjusted by directing the CO2 laser to hit areas other than the tin droplets once the specified dose has been applied. These parameters are meticulously controlled to ensure both accuracy and repeatability in the process. The CD of features can be fine-tuned by adjusting the exposure dose. For example, in positive photoresists, increasing the dose results in a wider space CD, while decreasing it narrows the space. The optimum exposure, EOP, is a specific energy level aimed at achieving the target CD. Surrounding this EOP is the exposure latitude, EL, defined as a plus or minus 10% range from the EOP. Within the EL zone, the CD's variation with energy follows a linear trend, defined by a parameter called dose sensitivity. This dose sensitivity allows for precise adjustments in dose to fine-tune the CD to desired levels. Consequently, dose sensitivity becomes a critical tool for CD modulation within the EL range. While a standard dimension tolerance of plus or minus 10% is often aimed for, Real-world factors like topographical variations, dose-setting errors, and mask CD discrepancies usually require a 6-10% to exposure latitude for a robust process. In the case of EUV lithography, the EL has shrunk to less than 5%, making process control even more challenging. A wider EL is generally preferred, as it offers better resilience against these variables, ensuring a more stable process that can handle minor variations without compromising feature quality. In photolithography, Focus is as critical as dose for controlling the CD of the features being printed. In ASML's twin scan systems, focus is determined by a UV level sensor that measures the Z value on the measure side. This Z value allows the focus to be adequately adjusted for each field on the wafer and fine tuned along the scanning Y direction on the exposure side. Despite the use of CMP technology to planarize the wafer, some degree of topography remains. This necessitates a minimum process window in the photolithography process to ensure precise pattern formation even on uneven semiconductor surfaces. This minimum requirement is known as the depth of focus, DOF, which should be at least 40 to 60 nanometers for high volume production in ARF lithography. Rayleigh DOF is a measure that tells us how much the focus can change before the printed pattern goes out of spec. It's calculated using a formula that includes the wavelength of the light, lambda, the numerical aperture of the lens, NA, and a process-dependent factor, K2. This formula is mainly applicable when you're working with low numerical apertures and trying to print very fine details. Optical path difference, OPD, 
comes into play when the wafer is defocused, creating a mismatch between the actual and desired light paths. This mismatch affects how the light interacts with the mask pattern, potentially ruining the printed features. The reason for setting the OPD to a quarter of the wavelength is to establish a limit. If the OPD were exactly a quarter wavelength, the zero and first diffracted orders of light would be 90 degrees out of phase, essentially cancelling each other out and preventing any pattern from being printed. So, the actual tolerable OPD has to be less than this quarter wavelength to ensure that a pattern can be formed. If the focus goes beyond this DOF, you'll encounter problems like pattern distortion or even complete failure to print the intended features. This is why maintaining the DOF is crucial for high-precision photolithography. However, this Rayleigh DOF criterion is applicable mainly to low numerical apertures when imaging dense patterns at the resolution limit. DOF can also be defined as the range of focus that keeps the resist profile of a given feature within all specifications like line width, sidewall angle, and resist loss while maintaining at least the specified exposure latitude. The effective focus is dependent on exposure, and both are coupled in their effect on the process. Therefore, a focus exposure matrix is often used to judge the response of the process to focus. In photolithography, the focus exposure matrix, FEM, is a crucial tool for simulating variations in focus and dose that naturally occur during the lithographic process. The FEM helps engineers find the optimal settings for focus and exposure, thereby establishing a process window. Within this window, the lithographic process is expected to produce features that meet specific size and shape requirements. To measure the size of a focus exposure process window, the first step is to graphically represent errors in focus and exposure as a rectangle on the same plot as the process window. The width of the rectangle represents the built-in focus errors of the processes, and the height represents the built-in dose errors. The problem then becomes one of finding the maximum rectangle that fits inside the process window. However, there is no one answer to this question. There are many possible rectangles of different widths and heights that are maximum, in other words, they cannot be made larger in either direction without extending beyond the process window. The result is a very important trade-off between exposure latitude and depth of focus. The FEM is not just a tool for simulation but also serves as a data visualization method. It can show contours of constant line width versus focus and exposure, which is especially useful for setting the limits of exposure and focus that allow the final image to meet certain specifications. This contour plot form of data visualization is essential for establishing what is known as the focus exposure process window. This window shows how focus and exposure work together to affect line width, sidewall angle, and resist loss. All values of focus and exposure within this window produce features that meet the profile specifications. During the development phase, engineers usually monitor the formation and changes in the shape of both isolated and dense lines, as well as contact holes. The FEM is key to understanding the relationships among these designed and developed resist features. The Bossung curve is another indispensable tool for understanding the lithographic process. First plotted in 1977 by John Bossung, it's sometimes called a smile curve due to its unique shape. The Bossung curve plots the CD of a feature as a function of focus for different exposures. The flatness of these curves indicates the process's tolerance to defocus, while the closeness of the curves reveals the CD's high dependence on exposure. These curves are also useful for characterizing the behavior of individual features in relation to exposure and defocus settings. Irregularities in the curves can indicate the presence of aberrations, vibrations, measurement noise, or other imperfect imaging conditions. The Bossung curve is part of a broader focus exposure matrix that also includes sidewall angle and resist loss as responses. This matrix is essential for understanding how focus and exposure are coupled in their effect on the process. The Bossung plot shows line width versus focus for different exposures and is one of the most common curves used in this matrix. It's crucial for understanding how the process becomes more sensitive to other processing errors like exposure dose when an image goes out of focus. In this examples, the Bossung curves and process windows are generated in terms of target sizes or CD data. In general, such process windows can also include other targets such as edge placements, feature positions, resist sidewall angles, and line edge roughness. In summary, both the FEM and the Bossung curve are integral to the analysis of the exposure defocus window, a quality metric that determines the simultaneous influence of focus and dose on feature line width. In ARF lithography, it's generally considered that for critical layers, a 6-10% to exposure latitude and a depth of focus margin of at least 40-60 to 60 nanometers must be secured for the process to be considered productive. In the realm of photolithography, the exposure to defocus, ED, 
Tools offer a comprehensive framework for understanding the intricate relationships between focus, exposure dosage, and CD. These tools are designed to plot the same set of data that you would typically see in Boson curves but in a different space, that is, exposure to defocus space. This alternative plotting method gives rise to what is known as an ED tree. The ED tree is formed by three distinct curves. The upper curve represents the dose values needed to create features with 90% of the target CD. The center curve is for the exact target CD, often referred to as dose to size. The lower curve represents 110% of the target CD. The region between the upper and lower curves is crucial. Any combination of dose and defocus within this region will yield a target with an accuracy better than plus or minus 10%. This region is explicitly defined by the upper and lower ED branches, and any operating point within this ED region will produce an image that falls within the acceptable CD control budget. While it might be intuitive to plot ED trees on a linear scale for both exposure and defocus, the correct approach is to use a log scale. This is because exposure should be represented by ratios, allowing for a direct comparison of the horizontal and vertical distances in the ED region. Within this boundary, you can draw a rectangle or an ellipse to quantitatively define the exposure latitude, EL, and depth of focus, DOF, for a given feature. This shape, whether it's a rectangle or an ellipse, serves as the process window, specifying the dose and focus latitude of the process. It's important to note that dose latitude and DOF are not independent variables. In many applications, the usable DOF is determined based on a given dose latitude, which could be 5 or 10%. The ED tools extend beyond individual features to encompass multiple features in what is known as an ED forest. An ED forest is a collection of ED trees, each representing a different feature or condition. Since real-world pattern layouts contain multiple feature sizes and pitches, all of which must be exposed with the same dose and defocus settings, the individual process windows of these features must overlap. This overlapping area forms the common ED window, which is essential for multi-feature lithography. The size of this common window is a measure of the process's robustness and is often used to evaluate new lithographic processes and techniques. Now, let's talk about how ED tools compare with Boson curves. Boson curves are excellent for understanding single features but fall short when you need to understand the common behavior of multiple features or conditions. ED tools, on the other hand, allow for the superimposition of multiple situations to provide a common ED window, offering a more rigorous and comprehensive understanding of EL and DOF. This makes ED tools particularly useful for complex lithographic processes involving multiple features and conditions. In summary, ED tools offer a more detailed, versatile, and comprehensive framework for understanding the complexities of photolithography. They allow for the simultaneous evaluation of multiple variables and conditions, making them invaluable for process development and optimization. Their ability to provide a common ED window for multiple features sets them apart from Boson curves, offering a more holistic and detailed view of the lithographic process. In the field of photolithography, CD uniformity is a critical factor that significantly impacts yield, especially as technology nodes continue to shrink. The need for improvements in CD uniformity is ever-increasing and it can be broadly categorized into interfield, intrafield, and local CD uniformity based on wafer-level results. Interfield uniformity, also known as in wafer uniformity, IWU, or across wafer line width variation, AWLV, deals with field-to-field -field variations within the wafer. This can be managed using correction per exposure, CPE, methods, which adjust the dose for each field to minimize variations. On the other hand, intrafield uniformity, also known as infield uniformity, IFU, or across chip line width variation, ACLV, can be controlled using dose mapper, DOMA, technology. DOMA employs different techniques like Unicom for X slit direction uniformity and Digicom for Y scan direction uniformity to adjust dose variations, thereby reducing scatter. It's worth noting that these dose control methods for scatter reduction are effective only if the CD scatter exhibits fingerprint characteristics rather than random fluctuations. The dose mapper technology consists of active scanner adjustments for applying dose profiles in both scan and slit directions. It decomposes wafer uniformity systematic errors extracted from inter- and intra-field CD measurements and creates a dose recipe that provides optimal CD uniformity performance. This technology also has the capability to account for systematic errors originating from various sources like etchers and masks, making it a comprehensive solution for CD uniformity control. Compared to the dose mapper, the upgraded CDU optimizer has significantly enhanced its high-order correction capabilities. For intrafield corrections, 
it has moved from 6th order to free form, and for inner field, it has advanced from 6th to 13th order. However, the application of such high order corrections is constrained by the need for extensive measurement data and the challenges in accurately extracting fingerprint data. Therefore, the use of high order corrections is carefully calibrated to avoid overcomplicating the process. Another aspect to consider is mask CD scatter, also known as Inten CD, which has a significant impact on intrafield scatter. The dose mapper feature in ASML scanners, for instance, can be fed forward with data from tools like Carl's Ice Galileo which measures full-field reticle transmission. This can lead to significant improvements in CD uniformity, sometimes up to 50%, and also shortens the turnaround time, TAT, for the entire DOMA process from days to about an hour. Furthermore, tools like Dose Mapper are not just limited to intrafield corrections, they also enable intrawafer corrections to account for process chamber footprints, provided these footprints are stable. In summary, CD uniformity is a complex issue with multiple contributing factors, each requiring specific control mechanisms. Technologies like CPE and DOMA offer robust solutions for managing interfield and intrafield CD uniformity, respectively. These technologies are essential for meeting the stringent requirements of modern photolithography processes, especially as we move to smaller technology nodes where even minor variations can have a significant impact on yield. In the realm of semiconductor manufacturing, CD is a term that's traditionally used to describe the average width of a line or the diameter of a contact within a given field of view. However, as the size of device features has continued to shrink, the concept of local CD uniformity, LCDU, has gained prominence. LCDU essentially quantifies the variability in dimensions between different lines and contacts within a field of view. This is usually captured using a CD SEM. As we venture into smaller and smaller feature sizes, line edge roughness, LER, starts to play an increasingly significant role. It begins to eat into the budget allocated for controlling these minuscule feature sizes. LER is a measure of how much the edge of a line deviates from being perfectly straight. It's quantified using the standard deviation, often represented as 3 sigma, of these deviations. To get these measurements, the pattern of interest is divided into multiple short segments along its length, and each segment CD is measured. These measurements are usually taken from top-down CD SEM images. LER becomes especially critical when the feature sizes are around 100 nanometers or smaller. For instance, in ARF lithography, it's common to see LER values of 4 nanometers or even larger. When you go below 100 nanometers, the typical 3 sigma LER is about 5% of the nominal CD. LER is not just a random occurrence, it's induced by a variety of fluctuating factors at these tiny dimensions. These include shot noise, variations in the distribution of chemical species like photoacid generators in the resist, and the random walk nature of acid diffusion during the chemical amplification process. The impact of LER is not uniform, it varies depending on the specific layer of the device and the technology used. For example, LER can affect the uniformity of various line patterns in the active area, gate line, and metal line, leading to defects like micro bridges and broken lines. This is exacerbated in EUV lithography, where the photon count is just 1 14th of that in traditional ARF lithography for the same dose. This amplifies the stochastic effects, making issues of LER and contact edge roughness, CER, even more severe. CER is another key factor affecting device performance. In devices with high aspect ratio contacts, such as those found in 3D non-channel holes and DRAM capacitors, CER can influence the distribution of write or read operations, leading to operational inconsistencies. In the context of EUV, this can result in defects like missing or merging contacts, thereby preventing the full utilization of EUV's maximum resolution capabilities. To mitigate issues of LER and CER, focus is often placed on improving the normalized image log slope or NILs. NILS measures the steepness of the aerial image and is directly correlated with better edge definition. A higher NILS value generally means lower LER. NILS is calculated by normalizing the slope of the aerial image intensity near the desired photoresist edge by the intensity, effectively neutralizing the influence of dose. NILS can be enhanced through a range of advanced resolution technologies, including immersion lithography, high numerical aperture optics, off-axis illumination, optical proximity correction, source mask co-optimization, phase shift masks, and so on. Despite the potential for improvement through metrics like NILs, it's important to remember that there are inherent limitations due to the stochastic nature of the processes involved.
One such stochastic effect is photon shot noise, which arises from the random arrival times of individual photons during the exposure process. This randomness can introduce variations in the energy delivered to different parts of the photoresist, affecting the precision of feature sizes and contributing to LER and CER. Therefore, while photolithography processes can be optimized to some extent, they can't entirely eliminate LER and CER issues. In the rapidly evolving field of semiconductor manufacturing, various technologies are being developed and implemented to improve line edge roughness, LER. It's important to note that the technologies discussed here could either advance rapidly or become obsolete in a short period due to the fast-paced nature of the industry. One such technology is sidewall image transfer, SIT, a form of multiple patterning technology. It utilizes ALD oxide deposition to create a sidewall spacer, which results in excellent LER characteristics. The CD is determined by the deposition thickness. However, the downside is an increase in the number of process steps and the need for additional photo layers for trimming, which raises production costs. This technology has been in use for an extended period, especially before the mass adoption of EUV technology. Another technology comes from Tel Company, known as Atomic Layer Etch, ALE. The hardware in the etch chamber is configured to allow ALDSIO2 deposition. By cycling between ALDSIO2 deposition and etching, the technology effectively reinforces the thickness of recessed areas while quickly removing protruding areas due to a 3D effect. Although this cyclical process can reduce productivity, it has been the most successful in resolving LER issues in EUV photoresists and has been implemented in mass production. Impria's metal oxide resist, MOR, is another noteworthy material. Unlike traditional car types, it's a negative type resist that undergoes crosslinking upon exposure. It has higher sensitivity to EUV, making it effective against stochastic effects. However, it requires a high dose, and as throughput issues are resolved, its application is gradually expanding. Lastly, LAMS dry development technology is gaining traction. It employs tin-based resist materials like MOR as etch use hard masks, eliminating the need for wet development. A recent study from Samsung revealed that integrated speckle accounts for 26 to 31.9% of LWR and can be managed to improve LCDU and LER. Specifically, doubling the number of pulses in a contact hole pattern improved LCDU by 1.7%, while altering pulse duration reduced speckle by 15.3%, resulting in a 3.1% LWR improvement. Given the rapid advancements and potential obsolescence in semiconductor technology, continuous monitoring at platforms like SPIE conferences is essential for staying updated. After the photolithography process is completed on a 300mm wafer, CD measurements are taken at 13 strategically chosen points. These points are not randomly selected, they are meticulously organized based on their relative positions to the wafer center and its edges. The first group of points is situated around the very middle of the wafer, capturing the core characteristics. The second group, known as the core periphery, includes points like top center, bottom center, right center, and left center. As we move outward from the center, the next group is the outer periphery, which captures points such as top left, top right, bottom left, and bottom right. The final group is oriented along the cardinal directions, featuring points at the top, bottom, left, and right edges of the wafer. This nuanced approach to organizing the sampling points is essential for effectively managing both the yield and the sensitive nature of CD values. In yield management, the emphasis extends beyond merely measuring uniform distance from the wafer center. The goal is to achieve a comprehensive representation of the entire wafer area. For instance, focusing on a 150mm diameter area in a 300mm wafer would only account for a quarter of the wafer's total surface. Such limited sampling would overlook the wafer's peripheral regions. Therefore, CD measurement locations are strategically chosen to uniformly represent the wafer's full expanse. Additionally, the outermost edge chips on the wafer are often given special attention due to their higher numbers, making them a focal point for meticulous management. In the volume production phase, CD control is managed on a run-to-run, R2R, basis using statistical process control, SPC, and automatic process control, APC, technologies. These technologies are deeply rooted in Six Sigma and quality control principles. For a photolithography process to be viable for mass production, it must have a process capability index, CP, greater than 2.0. This is similar to needing a parking space that is at least 2 meters wide if your car has a 1 meter variation in parking. 
This variation is referred to as the upper and lower control limits, while the parking space width is known as the upper and lower specification limits. During mass production, an X-bar chart is used to periodically monitor the process mean. The X-bar should always fluctuate within the upper control limit, UCL, and lower control limit, LCL, to ensure stable production. Typically, the variation between UCL and LCL is managed within plus or minus 3 sigma, or a 6 sigma variation, which translates to a 99.7% pass rate. This 6 sigma approach ensures that the vast majority of products fall within the desired specifications, minimizing defects. APC methods like singular spectrum analysis, SSA, and exponentially weighted moving average, EWMA, are employed to manage this variation. SSA involves continuous monitoring of recent production variations. Fine-tuning is done if they are on target, slow control is applied if off-target but trending, and fast control is applied if off-trend but within specifications. This comprehensive approach ensures that variations in equipment, material, and environmental conditions in a clean fab are continuously managed to maintain a pass rate within 99.7%. Now let's delve into today's subject, lithographic CD control. Central to this field is the CD-SEM instrument, outfitted with various electron guns such as field emission and Schottky emission types. These guns produce an electron beam that is focused by a condenser lens and steered through an objective lens, which incorporates elements like electromagnetic deflection coils or electrostatic deflection plates. The instrument's detector employs energy filters along with retarding and boosting methods to enhance image resolution. For automated data collection, a design gauge tool specifies the measurement locations. Turning our attention to CD-SEM imaging, we encounter terminologies like ADICD, AEICD, and ACICD. CD-SEM images can be captured using secondary electrons, offering topographical contrast due to edge-slope effects. Alternatively, backscattered electrons provide material contrast and are particularly useful in high-voltage SEM for in-cell overlay measurements, albeit with some risk of damage. Image processing employs techniques such as super-resolution and a variety of edge detection algorithms, including threshold, linear, and differential methods. Charging effects and CD slimming are also factors in ARF photoresists, mitigated by employing ARF mode. Next, let's discuss the process window, characterized by exposure latitude and depth of focus. Tools like the Focus Expose Matrix and Boson Curve help visualize this window. The Exposure Defocus tool further elucidates the process window by employing branches, trees, and forests to clarify the overlap process window. Lastly, CD control is a complex domain. Interfield and intrafield uniformity are regulated through methods like correction per exposure, dose mapper, and Carl Zeiss Galileo systems. Local CD uniformity takes into account elements like line edge and line width roughness, contact edge roughness, and nils. Photon shot noise, a stochastic phenomenon, can be alleviated through techniques such as sidewall image transfer, atomic layer etching, Impria's MOR resist, and LAMS dry development. Wafer-to-wafer -wafer uniformity is maintained via statistical process control, complemented by automatic process control systems for long-term consistency. In summary, we've taken a comprehensive look at lithographic CD control, exploring its instrumentation, imaging methods, process windows, and control strategies. How did you find our latest exploration into the world of CD? A mix of simplicity and complexity, right? Today, we delve deep into the complexities of lithographic CD control, an essential element in semiconductor manufacturing. While the topic may have been technical, we hope it enhanced your understanding. Thank you for navigating the intricate world of photolithography with us. There's still much to discover, and we'll continue to unravel the layers in future episodes. If you found value in this episode, please consider giving us a like, subscribing, and turning on notifications so you won't miss out on upcoming insights. Your continued engagement is what drives us forward. Stay tuned to Semi-Slides as we keep shedding light on the enigmatic world of semiconductors. We can't wait to bring you more in-depth content in our next episode.